If you would, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. We'll begin reading from verses 13 through 19. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon P uh, Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou sh shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The end of Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This past Wednesday, if you were here, you were able to hear a lesson from Adam Richardson on what a day and what it, what it might have been like to experience, to, to witness God uh, creating everything. And I've heard from a few that he did a great job, as I uh, trusted he did. Whether he did good or not, it would have been amazing. Uh, it would have been spectacular to have been there to witness God create everything. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 is one of, I won't say it's, it's the most, because there's a lot of really good scriptures in, in, uh, in the Bible. Uh, but it, it is, the beginning of it is beautiful. Maybe one of the most beautiful scriptures in all the Bible. And the end of it is terrifying, because of the context of what's happening. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, They, talking about Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God, listen to this, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I'm always amazed by that verse. I picture in my mind, and I've shared this with you before, I've pictured in my mind, I, I like going on walks. I, I like when it's the, the cool of the evening and, and you're able to walk with your loved ones, whether that's your spouse or, or your children. And especially, I, I found it's, it's so, and, and it's true, you know, I, I love Lena and we have a great, amazing love for one another, but there's nothing quite like a love for a parent and a child. And when my children, uh, Benjamin's not old enough to, to walk yet, but when Riley uh, holds my hand and, and walks with me and we're walking down the, uh, down the road or through the woods, that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's what I picture here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, where God comes and is walking in the garden, the Garden of Eden, the most perfect place there's ever been on this earth. He's walking in the cool of the evening. And I, I imagine, I, we don't know from Scripture, but I imagine, I hope, that this wasn't the first time uh, that God had come down before in the cool of the evening and walked hand in hand with His children. And the beauty uh, and the, the amazingness of, of the beginning of that verse, but then the second part of the verse is, is terrifying. Notice what it says, the second part. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did they hide themselves? Because they had just sinned. The, the fall of man is about to take place in Genesis chapter 3. It, it, in reality, it's already happened. It's just going to be uh, pronounced to them. It's going to be declared to them by God. And that he's, God's going to call them out on the, the fact that they have done the one thing that God asked them not to do. So Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 uh, starts with the amazing picture, the amazing scene that, we, you, that you talked about Wednesday night if you were here. And Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 starts with what's going to be the topic of this Wednesday's summer series lesson, I come to the garden alone. 
Uh, Craig Middleton from the Aiken Church of Christ is going to be here to, to present the lesson. And I hope that you will uh, take the time to be here again. I think there are a few more uh, invitation cards out there. If not, I'll be sure to get some ordered this week. But, but go ahead and invite. You don't have to have a card to invite someone. Uh, invite someone. Again, we have a meal here at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, and then uh, at 7 o'clock we'll have our message. Uh, members, of course, if you're planning on coming, there is that sign-up list that we encourage you to sign up uh, on to be a part of that. But imagine, uh, last week we looked at what would it have been like to, to witness God create everything. This week, let's imagine the first part of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 to start with. What would it have been like to be in the Garden of Eden, uh, to, to experience life in perfection here on earth? But then a part of coming to the Garden is also realizing that man messed up. That Adam and Eve messed up perfection. That sin and Satan messed up the plan that God had for mankind. If you look around the world, if you look in your life, if you look in the life of other people, you, you realize that that's, that's kind of a common theme, isn't it? It doesn't take man, it doesn't take humans, not just men, ladies. Uh, it doesn't take humans very long to mess things up. Uh, there, there can be a, a situation that's perfect, that things are just exactly how they should be, and just give it a little bit of time, and someone will do something that they shouldn't do. Uh, sin will enter the picture, and the perfection that may be perceived will be changed. The same is true of the church, isn't it? We read, uh, that was just read to us, Jesus said, I'm going to establish my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. God, uh, Jesus said, Satan, the gates of Hades, death, those things will not be able to destroy or to prevail or to defeat the church. And that's true. That hasn't happened. But has the church been harmed over the centuries? Absolutely. And you look around today, and I've shared this frustration with you before, that, that if you or I were someone who was uh, looking or, or interested in Christianity, maybe, they, uh, maybe you grew up a little bit in, with a, a faith in Christ or a faith in God, or, or maybe if you didn't at all and you were interested in just learning about Christianity, if you looked in the, the, the world today, at least certainly in American culture, you wouldn't know what to do. You wouldn't know where to go. Because there's, there's so many different choices and it's not, you know, generally we think of choice as a good thing. You know, why do people like buffets? Because they can get whatever they want to eat, okay? But that's, that's, that's a problem when it comes to religion. That's a problem when it comes to Christianity because not only are there so many, but they're so different, they contradict one another unless you are of the mindset, well, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, and we, we recognize the, the hypocrisy in that because one denomination or one group or one uh, group of, of believers will say this and the other will say this. And, and they have direct, you know, they directly contradict one another. And more importantly, they contradict what Scripture says. The question that I want to consider this morning is a, a question that could be uh, difficult. It could be something that is, is not comfortable for us to talk about, but must be talked about, I believe. Uh, we must talk about it as members of the church. If you are, are here and you're visiting with us, uh, I want you to know, I want all of us to know and realize that in, in this lesson and, and in lesson and conversations with, with people who are of a different faith or of a different belief or a different group of believers, that we need to approach it with love and we need to approach it, hum approach it humbly realizing that as we are seeking the truth, we need to help others seek the truth as well. The question this morning that I'd like for us to consider is, what does the Bible say about denominationalism? Well, what in the world is denominationalism? A lot of us probably know what that is, but, but that's probably not a word, again, we use very often in our, our everyday conversations. Even, even in our everyday spiritual conversations, when, when someone says, well, where do you go to church? We don't ask the question, well, what denomination are you? Uh, we say, well, where do you go to church? And well, somebody may say, well, I'm Baptist, or I'm Methodist, or I'm Catholic, or I'm this, or that, or the other. We may say any number of, of different things in, in our world today. Uh, so denominationalism is, is in an easy definition, is all the different beliefs that exist within Christianity, and all the contradictions and confrontations that exist within those uh, within denominationalism, and even the, the differences and the, the, the division that exists within individual denominations. Uh, you take, for instance, the one that I'm most familiar with, because it's probably the biggest one in, in the South, at least, or in the South Carolina area, or the place that I grew up in, the, the Baptist Church. Well, there's Southern Baptists, there's uh, all these other different kind of Baptists, there's, there's divisions, there's differences, even within a denomination. So, what, 
what does it mean? What, why, what does the Bible say about denominationalism? In, in a word, nothing. The Bible doesn't say anything about denominationalism. Uh, the Bible describes one church in Scripture. In the New Testament in particular, there, there's only one church. It's the one that Christ died to establish. Now, it's described in different ways. It's described as the church of God. It's described as the church of Christ. It's described uh, as a, a multitude of congregations of the same church, of the same body over a, a general area. Romans chapter 16, verse 16, that we're fond of saying, uh, the churches of Christ salute you. Well, that's not talking about these, these multiple different religious groups that have different beliefs. That's talking about the same group that has the same beliefs, but they're meeting in different places across a given area. The churches of Christ. We would say the congregations of York County, perhaps, or something along those lines. Uh, it, it's also described in, in the New Testament as the way. And of course, Christians are, are followers. Disciples are first called Christians at Antioch. There are a number of different descriptions of the same church body. Of the same church, because there is only one church mentioned in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, in the context of worship, and we'll mention this again later, in the context of worship, uh, God is described as a God that is not of confusion, a God not of confusion. Uh, that He doesn't want there to be confusion in our, in our worship. That's why we do things decent, decently in an order, in a, in a proper manner, that there needs to be a, a structure to our worship. That not everyone just needs to, uh, to get up and, and, and lead a different song. You know, that's why we have a, a song leader. Someone stands up here and we have it up on the PowerPoint. What if, what if while uh, Ryan was leading singing this morning, I started singing Jesus Loves Me? Well, the kids might start singing that really loudly because they may know that one better. Uh, and that might be a beautiful thing, but would that be decently and in an order? Would that, would that cause confusion or would, would everybody just go along? Well, you wouldn't know who to go along with. It, there, there, it's just an easy example. What if right now one of you decided, well, I don't really like what Andy's talking about. Uh, so I'm going to start you know, preaching my own lesson. Or I'm going to go over here to the small auditorium because they're kind of over here to the side and, and they're going to do their own thing. It would be confusing. And God is not a God of confusion. In our worship... And we understand that in, in this, this context. But certainly we understand that in the context of, of Christianity. There, there, there's something wrong when so many different people call themselves followers of Christ, but teach so many different things. Many of them contradicting one another, and a lot of them contradicting Christ. There's something wrong with that. So we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Let's consider a couple of questions about uh, the church this morning. First of all, God knew that He would save mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, starts out in the garden, things are wonderful, things are amazing. It doesn't take long until man messes things up. And then in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God is talking to the serpent there, God is talking to Satan, and it's this first messianic prophecy that Excuse me, that, uh, that there will be the, uh, dissension or, or uh, a confrontation between the seed of, of man and the, the seed of, uh, of Satan. That there's going to be this, uh, this, this confrontation that goes on. And, and that's talking about Jesus coming and dying and, and crushing the head of Satan and defeating him. And, and we appreciate that. And some may, some may look at that as, okay, well, uh, God created everything for those six days. He made everything perfectly. When he, when he saw it at the end of the sixth day, behold, it was very good. He puts Adam and Eve into the garden. Things are going smoothly. And then Adam and Eve sin and God has to come up with a plan. It, some people may look at that as, a, as an afterthought. But the reality is, is that God knew before he even created man, before he even created anything, that he would have to save man and he knew how he would do it. Jesus' sacrifice was planned before the world's foundations were laid. Before God said, let there be light. He knew that his creation, mankind, would need a savior. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21, it talks about how Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, in the New King James Version, it talks about uh, <clears throat> the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Those are just a couple of scriptures. We'll talk about a couple more here in, in a few minutes. But, but God knew before the creation of the world that His creation, mankind, would need to be saved. Let's consider also, secondly, that God knew that the church would be established in order to spread the gospel of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. You may want to turn there or, or write this down at least. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. 
It says there, so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. In those couple of verses, in those couple of phrases we read from those verses, we see God's plan not only for Jesus before the beginning of the world, but also for the church. God knew before he created anything that we would sin, that mankind would sin, and not only that Adam and Eve would sin, but that we would have a problem with sin in our lives, that all would sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. He knew that, he created us anyway, and before he created us, he purposed, he designed, he decided to make there be a way where that problem of sin could be figured out. And that was figured out through Jesus, but also that manifold wisdom of God, the gospel of Jesus, would be made known through the church. The church has always been a part of God's plan. Uh, here, here's just a couple of examples. We talked about in our Bible class this morning, Dow did a great job in, in Acts, which is where we were at, and he talked about how there are 300 plus, I believe, uh, uh, messianic prophecies or prophecies of a, a Messiah, prophecies of a coming Savior. Uh, and and there, are, there are tons of those, but, but in many of those, not only is the Messiah talked about, but, but a church or the kingdom uh, is talked about as well. 750 years before Christ was born, Isaiah and Micah uh, announced the eventual establishment of the Lord's house in the last days in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, uh, in, in his sermon, Peter talks about how uh, the, the things that were happening on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 were those last days. We see the connection there, the fulfillment of prophecy. 500 years before Christ, Daniel declared the coming of the Ancient of Days and the establishment of an everlasting kingdom that would far outlast any human kingdom that would ever be established. And then most importantly, and as was read to us earlier in, in Matthew chapter 16, the second part of verse 18, Jesus says, Upon this rock, the rock solid fact that he is the Son of God, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Let me sum this up for you before we move on. The church, the body of Christ, of which he is the head, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, has been a part of God's plan since before the foundation of the world. God purposed, He decided ahead of time to create mankind, knowing that we would sin, yet still wanting and desiring a relationship with us and making a way possible for that relationship to flourish. And the plan was for Jesus to come and die and to rise again and for the church to spread that message. That's been the plan before the foundation of the world. Realize this. We're 2,000 years after Jesus, and you are a part of the plan of God that was planned before the creation of the world. And you have a role to play in the plan of God, to spread, to make known the manifold wisdom of God. What manifold wisdom? That's the, the, the fullness of God's wisdom. And that is seen most clearly in the gospel plan of salvation for all mankind. Let's consider this morning, a couple of questions. Question number one, does it matter where I go to church? Now, we've talked briefly about, uh, you know, the church and how it's a part of God's plan. So, so does it matter where I go to church? There are all these different choices. There are all these uh, different groups that believe different things. And some of them, many, most of them, I would say, uh, if, you, if you walked into a, a, a church building up and down uh, Cherry Road or up and down uh, Oakland Avenue or wherever else that you may, may find a church building here in Rock Hill, you would probably be pretty accepted. You could walk in there and they'd welcome you and they'd encourage you to come and sit down and to worship with them just like, just like we do. So does it matter? What's the difference? Does it make a difference where we go or where do we attend church? Let me say this. It matters what church you're a part of. Jesus said he would establish his church. In Acts chapter 2, as was talked about in Bible class this morning, uh, and for the last few weeks, for those of you who are in the adult Bible class, which I would certainly encourage you uh, to come to if you haven't been able to make it. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, when the church was first established, let's notice some things about that. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. We'll be there for uh, the majority of the rest of our lesson. In Acts 2, the church is, is first established. The people there uh, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. After they've heard a lesson that's presented, that provided proof both from Scripture and from experience that He was. Uh, it, it provides proof from Scripture and that it goes back to the Old Testament. And, and it covers some of those Messianic prophecies, some of those prophecies about this coming Messiah, this, this coming Christ. And it also, Peter also in his sermon says, you know this Jesus. 
This Jesus whom you've crucified, you, you know who he is. You, you've seen it. And, and most of the people there at least had heard of Jesus. Many of them had seen Jesus. Some of them per perhaps have even had followed Jesus at some point and maybe left and, and come back and forth a few times. But they, they knew who Jesus was. They heard the gospel of Christ, the death, the burial and resurrection after the life of Christ. And this gospel of Christ produced an active, a, a want to do something about it kind of faith. That's what we read about in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 17. That's the kind of, of faith that we hear about. That faith, here com faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And that's the kind of faith that leads to salvation. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 41. Acts 2, 37 through 41. Now, when they heard this, okay, well, what had they heard? They, they had heard this message that I just talked about. That Jesus, this Jesus whom they had crucified, was both Lord and Christ. He was the one who had been prophesied from old. He is the one whom they had witnessed. Uh, not just the apostles had witnessed, not just the, the followers of Jesus had witnessed, but most of the people there had seen Jesus do something miraculous. They knew this. They knew him. They believed him uh, to be the Christ. This is what it says here in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who received his word were baptized, and that, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls." So this lesson is presented to them, and, and what's the result of this lesson? What's the result of hearing the truth of the gospel? What do they say? That they're pierced through the heart. They, they accept it. They, they admit it. They, they believe that Jesus is the Christ, and they want to do something about it. So they say, what can we do about this? What, what, what is it that we can do? And, Jesus, and Peter tells them in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Because they had already heard about Jesus. They had already believed in Jesus. They had expressed a confession because they accepted it and wanted to know what they could do about the problem that they had. The fact that they had been a part of killing Christ. And they wanted to do something about it. So they say, what, what can we do about it? Uh, and we say, repent and be baptized. And that's absolutely right. But what's the result of repenting and being baptized? Of, of these things that, that this group does here in Acts chapter 2. They're saved. What can we do about this? What can we do about this problem? We, we realize that we're in a dangerous situation. What can we do about it? Notice verse 41 and verse 47. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And there were added about 3,000 souls. So on the day of Pentecost, the first day of the church, the first gospel sermon is presented. They say, what can we do about it? He tells them what to do about it. And those who received his words, those who accepted the truth of his word, were baptized. Why? Because that was a part of what he said to do. And then verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the last part especially, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this message, this, this gospel, this, this answering of the question, what can we do about this situation that we're in, was continually taught. And taught more and more. And in verse 47 we read that more and more people continue to be added to the church. More and more people continue to be saved. How? Through hearing about Jesus. Believing in Jesus. Wanting to do something about that. We call that today repentance. By confessing him. And that's, that's a part of that repentance. You're not going to repent if you don't confess or if you don't really believe it. And then they want to be baptized so that they can be saved. Question number two this morning. But does it matter where I go to church? So it matters what church you're a part of. Uh, we, we can see that. Christ died to establish His church. In Acts chapter 2, uh, we, we see that they were baptized in the name of Jesus to become a part of, of the church. This is, again, those who accepted, those who believed, they dedicated themselves to Christ and they were baptized. Uh, and, and later even more baptized. This is the church that is talked about in the New Testament. And this is the church that you and I want to be a part of. The church that Jesus died to establish and that Peter used those keys to the kingdom that he's given in Matthew chapter 16 to open up the door to that kingdom. So it doesn't matter to what church I go to. Uh, can, can I be a part of the, uh, the kingdom? Can I be a part of the church and then just uh, attend anywhere? Does it matter? What's, again, what's the, the difference? 
Let's notice a few other things from Acts chapter 2 about this church that Jesus died to establish and that Peter used those keys given to him by Jesus to open the door to the kingdom. And let's notice what happens here. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 44, they, who is they? The church. That's who it is. It's, it's Christians. It, they're not called Christians yet, but it's those who have uh, believed in Jesus and, and decided to follow Him and been baptized and had their sins washed away. They, they're, they're Christians. That was, that's what we would call them. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the, apostle, through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common." We can tell from these verses, and, and many of us here, many of you here are certainly st students of Scripture, so you know this. Clearly the church spent a lot of time together. Uh, and on the first day there are 3,000 souls that are added. So the church goes from 120, it looks like, in, in uh, the beginning part of Acts or so, 120 or so believers, to 3,000. That'd be a pretty big difference, wouldn't it? You know, they, they go from meeting in an upper room to that upper room's not going to hold them anymore, right? They, they've got some, some serious logistic problems that they've got to figure out. Where are we going to meet? So they generally end up uh, meet, meeting in the temple. Uh, it's, it's suggested if, as we, uh, in Acts chapter 7, before the, the death of Stephen and the great persecution of the church, which happens in, uh, in Jerusalem, it's suggested uh, that there's an estimated number of 20,000 Christians in Jerusalem. That would be about one-third of Jerusalem's population. Imagine what that would be like. Uh, imagine be, living somewhere where one-third of everyone who is around you is a Christian. Imagine somewhere, no matter what the, the size of the, sound, the town, that 20,000 people were Christians. That would be pretty amazing, wouldn't it? If you, if you lived in a town where there were 20,000 other Christians, that would be pretty encouraging. But, but in, this, in this town of approximately 60,000 people, 20,000 of them are Christians. So when it says in verse 44, look, look at that again. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. All those who had believed, how many? 20,000 approximately. All those who had believed, 20,000 people were together. Does that literally mean, when we talk about the, the church needs to, to spend time together, that if we want to be a part of the church, we need to uh, be together and have all things in common like they were in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44. Does that, does that literally mean that there were 20,000 people who were constantly spending a lot of time together? Probably not. It would, be, it would have been very difficult for 20,000 people to meet anywhere at any point in time uh, in, in first century Jerusalem. Uh, it, it could be read, Acts chapter 2 and verse 44 could be read this way. And all those who had believed together had all things in common. All those who had believed together. I think when we, when we think about this, this idea of fellowship that it's talking about here, it's not just talking about and the least important part of fellowship is a meal, or is hanging out together, or spending time together. That's important. I, I value that. I think that is something that Scripture teaches that the church must do. But the fellowship they have is that they believed together. They all believed the same thing. What does the church look like today? What does Christianity look like today? Can we say that we believe together? That we all believe the same thing? No, it's totally different. Man has messed that up. Just like man messed up the Garden of Eden, man messed up the perfection of, of creation, man has messed up the church. In the beginning, they believed together. They all believed the same thing. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the doctrine that the apostles were giving. Uh, today, the church can't be described, Christianity in general cannot be described as, as unified. There's so many denominations, there's so many different groups of people that believe different things. And again, there's even division within each of those denominations. So, what does the Bible say about denominationalism? Nothing. But that's a little bit of a misnomer because Scripture says plenty against division. The Bible tells us plenty against division. That the church cannot be divided. And let me suggest to you again, that is exactly what denominationalism is. is a division of what God envisioned for the church. Uh, a simple way that, that I've learned to think about it, because I'm simple-minded, I guess. Denominationalism sounds a little bit like denominator. What's a denominator? It's the bottom part of a fraction well, a denomination is a fraction of what God would have the church to be. I don't want to be a part of a little bit of what God wants the church to be. I want to be a part of the church. I don't want to have some things right. 
I want to do everything right. I don't want to be, look a little bit like what God's plan was. I want to be what God's plan is. I don't want to be a part of anything that's not fully what God would have it to be. Uh, the first, uh, the, an easy example of this uh, is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Uh, even, even in the first century, shortly after the church is established, division uh, happens within the church. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13, Paul talking to the Corinthians says, there's division among you. Some of you say I'm of, of Paul, and some say I'm of Apollos, and some of, of Cephas, and some of, of Christ. And, and here's the powerful words that he says towards the, the end of that passage. He says, has Christ been divided? Now that's, 1 Corinthians wasn't written very long after the establishment of the church. Perhaps a few decades. But the question is already answered there, or, or asked there, has Christ been divided? And, and it's one of those rhetorical questions, right? What's the answer? No, Christ has not been divided. If you are divided, then you're not with Christ. If you have changed something, then you're not doing the right thing. Christ has not been divided. And that was true when 1 Corinthians was written, and that's true today. There is still and will always be only one church. The one that Christ said, I will establish my church. Now men may do different things to the church and may take it in different directions, but there will always be only one church. Christ has not been divided. He goes on, there, on, on to say there, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Again, emphasizing Christ. 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 Paul wasn't, baptized, wasn't crucified for us, was he? No, Christ was. We weren't baptized in the name of Paul, were we? No, we were baptized in the name of Christ. Because it's his church. The one church that he said he would establish. Let's think about briefly this morning as we can begin to wrap up. What must, what was the church united in and what must the church be united in today? Again, go to Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They, the church, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Look at verse 46. Day by day, continue, continuing with one mind in a temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Again, verse 42, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Verse 46, they were continuing with one mind. What was that one mind centered around? Well, they believed together the apostles' teaching. They believed all of them that were Christians, all of them that were a part of the church, they believed together the apostles' teaching. And they were continually devoting themselves to learning more of it, to reminding themselves about it, and to unifying around that. They followed the teachings presented to them by the apostles. Later it would be by prophets in the New Testament, and finally by the divinely inspired writers of Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we see that all Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful. It goes on to say different ways that it's useful. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, uh, that Scripture is not a matter of one's own interpretation, uh, but men guided by God wrote Scripture. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's the love chapter, we know that, but in, that, in verses 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians 13, we find a very important lesson, not necessarily about love, but about truth. That when all these miraculous gifts fade away, that when the, the perfect, the complete, the, the fruition of God's Word comes, that we would lose those abilities to do miraculous things. And that's what we have, you have, and I have today in the Bible. And for however long the Bible has been around, we don't know exactly perhaps when, when it was concluded, the exact date of that. But as long as we have had the, the complete Word of God, we have had no needs of miracles anymore. If we want to know what God wants us to do, I don't need to perform a miracle for you to know that. I need to read Scripture to know that. I don't need to, know, I don't need to have a, a prayer book. I don't need to have a creed book. I don't need to have anything else except what God has given to me in His Word. If I want to know what God wants me to do, I must continually devote myself to the doctrine found in Scripture, the message and the commands that we have from God. The Bible has authority for those who claim to be Christians. That means not just for perhaps our friends that are in, in different religious groups, but also for us. If I learn something new from Scripture, 
And if I'm committed to God, I must change my mind. I must change my actions to follow what God's Word reveals, no matter what I've believed or how long I've believed it. And that's just as true for us as it is for anyone else. Let's answer this question as, as again, we, we do wrap up, and we are getting there. What, what, where did all of today's division come from? We, we look back and, and we see in Scripture, it, it's pretty clear. There, there was some division. There was some, there was some, uh, some different thoughts, even some, some people who were going the, the wrong direction. But where did it start? And where do we get to where we have so many denominations today, so many different people who, who all claim to be Christians but believe and teach so many different things? Most of them, again, being contradictory. Well, the sad fact is it, it came from false teachers. In Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30, Paul is meeting there with the uh, Ephesian elders whom he loves. And he says to them that there will be those who will arise from among them, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That even from among elders or leaders of the church, they would arise from among those people, people who would speak perverse things or things that, that weren't right to draw people away after them. Uh, we're, we're warned about false teachers throughout the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament. Listen to what 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves in accordance uh, for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now there's a few phrases in there that you probably haven't used lately. Have you ever talked to somebody recently about tickling their ears uh, and been talking about the words that you're saying? Probably not. Uh, but, we, but we get the picture, hopefully. Uh, the, the picture is here that there's going to come a time, and it came really in reality, you could say, even in the time where, where Paul is, is writing this, certainly shortly after this, there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, what is sound doctrine? Well, if, if a building or if a, a structure is described as sound, that means it's going to stand. It's not going to fall. It's not going to tip over. It's not going to crumble or, or, or become uh, destroyed. It's sound. It's built well. Well, the, the, remember, what is it that Jesus is going to build His church? The rock-solid fact that He is the Son of God. And when we, or when they, want to not endure sound doctrine, that means that, that sometimes some of the, the doctrines and the teachings of Christ and the apostles and of Scripture, some of those things aren't easy. And we have to endure some of those. We have to, to make it through some of those. We have to uh, bear that burden sometimes. So when we endure sound doctrine, we, we make it through the good times and the bad times, the difficult times, of simply following what Scripture says. But it says wanting to have their ears tickled, what do they do? Instead of doing that, instead of wanting to endure the difficulty of, of true teaching, they want to hear what they, all, what they want to hear. They want to have their ears tickled. So they accumulate for themselves teachers who are going to preach things or teach things that they want to hear. And that, that certainly has happened in our world today. Uh, that there are, are people who uh, may be great speakers may be able to communicate things very clearly and very powerfully, but they don't address issues that Scripture addresses. They don't address in, important things, and they certainly perhaps even leave some things out. There were and there are false teachers that do it of their own accord. They do it because they want to draw people away to follow them instead of following Jesus. And there are some who do it because that's what the people want to hear. And maybe they're people pleasers, or, or maybe they just... Maybe some of them, some of them are, are afraid to, to stand up against what uh, the, their congregation or their group of people want to hear. Some, some false teachers in the first century and today do it because they want to be followed. Some do it because they want to, to please other people. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why they do it. It matters that they do it. Satan is the enemy. And Satan will use a false teacher, someone who teaches something contradictory to Scripture or doesn't teach everything in Scripture, He will use them to draw people away to not follow true doctrine, but instead doctrine that lines up with what people want to hear. But there is a divine way. Jesus died to establish His church. In John chapter 15 and verse 6, another verse that was mentioned in the Bible class this morning, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus died to establish His church. Scripture makes it clear that division within His church is not acceptable. 
It's not something that will be tolerated, and we cannot be His people if we don't follow His teachings. Now, there, there may be some things that, that we need to study about and, and learn about and, and grow more about. That There's always room for us to, to grow in understanding God's Word more clearly. But our aim and our effort must always be to follow God's Word, to follow Jesus' teachings. So what does the Bible say about denominationalism? Nothing good. It doesn't say anything good about it. It doesn't say anything good about there being division within the church. What does the Bible say about the church? It is Christ's. He built it, He heads it, He rules it, and He guides it. If we are part of anything different than what we read about in Scripture, we can trust that it did not come from God, and it is only a division of the totality of what God would have for His people to be. So let me suggest again to remind those of us who are here regularly, and to tell those of you who are visiting with us, I will not claim that I do everything perfectly. In my worship to God, in my service to God, in my life to God. But I will claim that I try to. That my aim and my effort is to do exactly what Scripture says. And I'm learning and I'm growing. And I would say that for every individual in this congregation. I would say that for the eldership of our congregation. And I would say that for our congregation as a whole. Our aim and our effort is to do exactly what Scripture tells us to do. Are there some things we need to learn, some things we can grow in? Perhaps. But our aim and our effort is to do exactly what Scripture says, nothing more and nothing less. Let me also conclude with this. That's the third conclusion. Uh, What's in a name? I don't know that the name, this is, I want you to listen to me, I want you to hear this. I don't know that the name of the church is found in Scripture. I don't know that the name of the church is found in Scripture. What's what's my name? My name is Andy. My name is Andy, and and, and that's, that's, that's my name. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't describe me because there are other Andys, right? Andy may mean something different to you than it means to me. When, when, when Lena thinks of Andy, she thinks of this, for better or worse. Uh, when you think of Andy, you may think of an, an Andy that you know. But Andy doesn't describe who I am. And it may mean something different to you than it means to me or to anyone else. In Scripture, we read Church of Christ. Church of God. We hear it described as the way. We hear followers of Christ, disciples of Christ called Christians. I don't think these are the names of the church. These are descriptions of God's people in the New Testament. It's the church of Christ. It's Christ's church. It belongs to Him. It's the church of God. It's God's church. It belongs to Him. It is the way because He is the way and we are following Him. We are called Christians because we are disciples of Christ. We adhere to the teachings, the doctrines of Christ. Therefore, we are called Christians. I don't know that the name of the church is found in Scripture, but clearly descriptions of who God's people better be are found in Scripture. They didn't have church signs in the first century that I know of that said Church of Christ, that said Church of God, that said the way, even that said Christians. But the people were known as followers of of Christ. The, the group was known as the church that belonged to Christ. Why do we call ourselves the church of Christ? Why do we have that on our sign? Because that's a biblical name for the biblical church that we want to be a part of. But I want us to, to remember and to not get so caught up in a name because sometimes, you know how I said earlier that, you know, in our, in our religious discussions that, you know, we don't say, well, what denomination are you a part of? We just say, well, where do you go to church? And some people say, well, I'm Baptist, and we kind of we know what that means. And some people say, well, I'm Methodist, and we kind of know what that means. And some people say, well, I'm Catholic, and we kind of know what that means. Well, we're guilty of saying, well, I'm Church of Christ. No, you're not. You are not Church of Christ. You are a member of the Church of Christ. You are a Christian. If we get caught up in allowing the name to describe us, then that's no different than I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist, I'm Catholic. You are a member of the church of Christ. You are striving to be who God would have us to be. 
And again, I, I know that may not sound good to, to some visitors that we have here this morning, but I want you to know, I want all of us to know that we need to strive daily to be the church that we read about in the New Testament, and I need to strive daily to be the Christian that would be accepted by God as a member of His body that He heads and that He died to establish. But how do you become a part of the church? In the same way they did on the first day. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're willing to confess that belief, repent of your sins, and be baptized to wash away all of your sins, then you can be a part of the church that Jesus established through His death, burial, and resurrection, and that Peter used the keys to the kingdom that were given to him in Matthew chapter 16 to open that kingdom in Acts chapter 2. If you want to study more, more about that, I can promise you one thing. If you study with me, if you study with our elders, if you study with the vast majority of our congregation, we won't take you anywhere but, but the Bible. And if we can point it to you in the Bible, you better believe it, because it's the Word of God. If you want to do that, we want to do that for you. Christians, live a life worthy of the calling by which you have been called. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life worthy of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for you. If you have any needs this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.